Okay, Cypress Bible Church, uh, question and answers, uh, this time on Christology. First question reads like this. What was the nature of Jesus' death on the cross? Did only his human nature die, or did he experience spiritual death as well? John 19 says Jesus gave up his spirit. What exactly does this mean? Did the Trinity become a duality during the time of Jesus' death? Okay, so this uh, question, of course, is going to reach into uh, realms of mystery that we don't have access to, but we we can say a few things about this. Uh, first of all, in order to answer this question, we've got to uh, understand what is meant by the word death itself. If death is to mean uh, to kind of to pass out of existence, well, then, of course, Jesus never died in that sense, because God himself, Jesus, could not pass out of existence. That's not something God can do. He's eternal by nature. So um, death, but even death for for a believer doesn't really mean this. Death means, theologically, the, the rending or the separating of soul from spirit. That's the theological definition of death. So If we define things that way, uh, did Jesus actually die? The answer is yes. When he gave up his spirit, that's what's being referenced. Jesus' heart actually stopped beating like our heart would stop beating if we died. And uh, his blood stopped pumping and he stopped breathing. And at that moment, his physical body was separated from his soul. So yes, in that sense, uh, Jesus did actually die. Uh, Did the Trinity become a duality? Uh, No, because, again, the spirit of of Jesus, the the immaterial part of Jesus, did not go out of existence. Um, So if we define physical death as that which is separating the the soul from the body, um, what would spiritual death be? And that's kind of the second part of this question, like what happened to Jesus Uh, on the cross? Could we say that he spiritually died? Well, in a sense, we could say yes in that sense as well, because again, if death means separation, what would spiritual death mean? That would mean something like being separated from God. And and we know that uh, the words of Jesus on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's just, it's almost like God is peeling back the curtain and we get this insight into whatever it means for all the sins of all humanity that ever believed in Jesus to be laid upon him on the cross so that Jesus absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. Like whatever that means, that separation from God, bearing the wrath, like we get a peak there. And I think that is what is meant by, uh, theologically, what's meant by spiritual death, that Jesus in some way had to be separated from the Father to bear the wrath of God on our behalf. Um, You know, another little glimpse we get into that is the darkness that falls upon the earth um, during those three hours of darkness. So mystery there to be sure, but I think... uh, understanding death in these terms, that is that it is primarily theologically the separating of body from soul physically and the separating of, of man from God spiritually. Um, those two terms at least help us get our minds around that question. Okay, the second question here in Christology, I'm going to group three of them together. The first question reads like this, when and how did Jesus learn the cross was his earthly destiny? Two, did he remember heaven? And three, did he remember the plan? If not, how did he learn it? So uh, this is probably referencing um, in our sermon on the humanity of Christ. We talked about the fact that if Jesus was truly human, like we're human, he had to learn things. He wasn't born with the knowledge that he was God. He had to learn that, in fact, he was God. That's a deduction. We're not reading that anywhere implicitly in Scripture. But um, but I really do think we ought to think through what does this mean. If Jesus really was a human, to be human, by definition, means to be limited. So uh, what what would this look like in terms of Jesus learning that he was God? How would he learn that? Well, keep in mind that Jesus, while he was 
human, he was certainly unfallen human. And one of the things that we talked about in our recent series on anthropology or the study of man is that the, when we fell, um, that fall, that that influence of sin affects all parts of our being, including our minds, our will, and our affections, right? So our minds are affected by sin, meaning Jesus, because he, yes, he was unfallen, but he, or yes, he was a man, but he was unfallen man. So he probably had an intellectual ability that it exceeded, that would exceed anything we would be uh, familiar with, even as a human. Um, but so Jesus, think, thinking about this, Jesus as a, as kind of an unfallen human, would have read the scriptures like we read them, but perhaps was able to put things together in ways that we would not otherwise be able to. But even us in our in our um, in our un, in our fallen humanity, I mean, we can read Isaiah chapter fifty three, and let's just read a few verses out of this uh, amazing chapter of the Old Testament. Again, predicting the suffering servant. Um, Isaiah fifty three verse one. Um, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And yet he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So here Jesus is reading the Old Testament, reading about this coming, promised, messianic servant, and he's reading that this is not going to be a man who's going to have a great life. Now look further what he says, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So if Jesus, through communing with the Father, prayer with the Father, has begun to realize that he is, in fact, that suffering servant simply by reading Isaiah 53 alone. I mean, the text goes on, but simply by reading that passage alone, you can start to get the picture of how Jesus might put together, man, I'm the one who is going to be crushed. How am I going to be crushed? I'm going to be pierced. And uh, and as he looks to the, to Rome, as he looks to what happens to seditioners, um, again, he, he's beginning to put these things together. Now, don't, don't, I wouldn't exclude the ministry, the supernatural ministry of the Spirit of God to Jesus through prayer. Um, God can certainly do that, right? I mean, we have examples of this all through the prophets where God gives very special direct messages um, from his, from, from via the Spirit of God to the messenger. Uh, this would certainly have been the case with Jesus. So, I mean, I, I'm not excluding that, but I just wanted to point out that in the scriptures themselves, Jesus would have read these scriptures and he would have seen himself in those scriptures. So um, I think that's the case. I think that, that we definitely get a, a glimpse of some of that um, in, in the scriptures themselves. Now, um, let's ask this fourth question here. Did Jesus' power as divine ever come out in his signs and miracles or... Were those all the Holy Spirit working through a perfect human nature that was submitted to God the Father? It seems in Scripture that Jesus operates out of his divine nature, not just human nature. For instance, in commanding wind and waves or forgiving sins. Okay, so again, we're just uh, we're just trying to parse this out as best we can. The phrase we used in the sermon series, and I think uh, I think it's just a great starting place. It, it, again, let me just say it one more time. Jesus, in becoming man, voluntarily surrendered the independent exercise of his divine attributes. So what this means is that, um, is that Jesus didn't give up his attributes as a human. Jesus voluntarily surrendered them. And to whom did he surrender them? Answer to the Spirit of God. So, so again, I think... 
What does it mean to be human? To be human means fundamentally to be limited. And I think anybody who kind of like pushes back on this and says, man, I don't, I don't like the way that sounds. Well, and I think the onus becomes on the, the, uh, the arguer to say, well, what is your definition of human? My definition of human, and I think all, you know, every single human understands that, well, I don't know the future. I don't know everything. I can't do miracles by myself. I mean, that's what it means to be human. If all that it means to be human is just to have a human body, well, then that's kind of the the Clark Kent heresy that we talked about earlier, where you know Jesus just kind of looks like a man, he acts like a man, but really he's just God dressed up like a man. He's just pretending, and that's not at all what the scriptures teach. So, um, so I think the best way to conceive of Jesus's miracle working ability in in the the life that he lived as a human is to say he was just as dependent on the Father as we would have been if we would have done those exact same miracles. Um, doing a miracle does not mean you have to be divine. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of examples in the Old Testament and New Testament where humans are able to do miracles via the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think that's what it means when Jesus, dependent upon the Spirit of God, was able to access his divinity and then work directly as God. I mean, that that would be a difference. He'd be working directly as God. But I think in the same way that he was dependent, we are dependent. Um, I also think it, it's important just to remember that uh, we're, we are in the area of mystery here. You know, I mean, I would certainly not be offended if someone was to say, um, you know, Jesus was exercising his divinity right here. I'm, nope. No problem. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not trying to say that Jesus couldn't have done that. The only argument we're making here in in um, the only point of emphasis we're making is to think and conceive of Jesus as a real human being. I think it just helps to understand the text uh, more accurately. Um, and that's kind of what we've said here just kind of answers this final question. It seems at times in the sermon that uh, the emphasizing Jesus' limitations, his humanity— his, need, his needing to learn, especially that he was God, not knowing these things, that we approach kenosis theology. Um, is it right to say that Jesus needed to learn that he was God or that the cross was his destiny in his human nature, but not in his divine nature? So um, kenosis theology is its referencing, the word kenosis is, comes out of Philippians 2, where it talks about Jesus. Um, emptying himself, and kenosis theology is actually a theological heresy in which it, in which the the claim is made that Jesus surrendered some of his divine attributes. So it's not that he voluntarily surrendered them to the Spirit. It's actually he surrendered them. He became something other than God when he became man, which is uh, theologically a heresy. So the questions asking here are in saying that Jesus was. Um, uh, functioning as a human, very much like we function as a human, is that not approaching kenosis theology? And again, the key distinction there is that Jesus possessed all of those attributes at all time. He never actually gave those up. He gave up the voluntary exercise of those divine attributes. So the analogy that I gave in the sermon a few weeks ago, I'll use it again here, is you know, I can have $5 million in a bank account and choose by my own volition not to take my credit card on a trip uh, overseas. Now, I would, I'm would i still functional. I mean, technically, I'm still very, very wealthy, but I've chosen to give up my credit card. Let's say I give it to uh, my spouse who's traveling with me. Now, anytime I would ask her, I'd say, hey, could I, could I have my credit card? And she would determine whether or not she would give it to me, and I could take my own credit card and use the money that I've, I've been given. That's maybe not a perfect analogy, but gives uh, some uh, you know, antecedent to how that might uh, physically play out. So hopefully this gives a little bit more just discussion around the person of Jesus, who he is, uh, and helps us uh, understand these things a little bit better. But great questions, and Again, I'm not going to try to answer all the uh, nuances and ins and outs of the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, we can never do that perfectly. But again, just pushing and helping us to think more accurately about who Jesus is.